Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. And also, welcome back to Solo RPG Friday. And today, we are going to be taking a look at Talisman Adventures, the Talisman RPG from Pegasus Spiel and Games Workshop, as well as the uh, Tales of the Dungeon expansion. So when this game was announced, I pretty much dismissed it, even though I am a huge fan of Talisman. You can see I have some Talisman stuff set up here to set the scene. Um, yeah, Talisman is in my top 10 games of all time. It's one of my most treasured and loved games, especially second edition. But it's also a pretty typical generic kind of fantasy game, fantasy setting. And I just questioned what Talisman Adventures, the role-playing game, was going to bring to the table that any other number of fantasy RPGs already out there haven't already done. You know, what is going to make this feel like Talisman? Well, about a month ago, a Dungeon Dive viewer asked me if I was going to cover this game at all, and I said, probably not. And they said, well, you know, if you, if I sent you a copy, would you take a look at it? And I said, most definitely, uh, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, he sent me a copy. I bought the uh, Tales of the Dungeon on my own, but he sent me a copy. And uh, so I started reading it and page by page, getting deeper and deeper into the book, I started absolutely falling in love with this game. There are so many great qualities to Talisman Adventures, and they did a brilliant job of translating the things that make Talisman a fun board game into an RPG and taking some of those very Talisman-esque elements and putting them into an RPG. I am quite shocked at how good this system is. As a matter of fact, I was reading some reviews of this online and watching some, some other YouTube videos and I heard people say that they were kind of angry at how good this game is because why didn't they think of it? And uh, yeah, it's it's quite something. Now, Talisman Adventures is not made for solo play straight out of the book, straight out of the box. There are no oracles included. There are no solo rules included. Nothing like that at all. However, it is, I think, one of the easiest systems to adapt to solo play because of the mechanisms. And throughout this review, we're going to be discussing those reasons uh, why I think that. There's a lot to cover. It's a little overwhelming. Uh, we're going to talk about the core book first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Tales of the Dungeon book. Uh, just for a spoiler alert, I love the core book. I was pretty disappointed with the dungeon book. And we'll talk a little bit about why. I think the mechanisms are fantastic. I think the gameplay is solid. However, I also do have some issues with the core rule book, mainly in some of the layout, the organization. And uh, I think it needs a real keen eye on it for a, a real keen editor's eye. There are quite a few little typos and mistakes in both books, actually. But we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. So this is a pretty hefty book. You're looking at about 200 pages, I believe, about 270 pages. And this contains everything that you need to play a game of Talisman as an RPG. It comes with these Fate Tokens. It comes with a sheet of Fate Tokens. And we'll talk a little bit about those um, in a bit. It comes with an overland map. This character creation supplement you can actually download on uh, Drive-Thru RPG, and it just has some charts and stuff on helping to create background for characters. It comes with a fold-out map of the realms, and this is pretty cool. I mean, this game really does take place in the realm of Talisman. You have your outer region, you have your middle region and you have your inner region. There is the river. And so it does feel like you are playing in the Talisman board game. It translates that kind of fairy tale adventure feel expertly. So the game is divided into two sections. The first section is you have your player section and those are color coded red at the top of each page. 
And then the second section is your Game Master section, and those are color-coded blue on the page, so that is quite handy. Now the game does, the book does open up with a lot of information before you get to character creation, and I think that's one of the problems. I usually like my RPGs to start with character creation because that's kind of how I typically learn a game is by creating a character and then learning the rules from there. This book front loads a whole bunch of lore and then a whole bunch of information before you even get to the character creation. As a matter of fact, the chapters for uh, your, your ancestries, which is like your races and your classes, is actually before how you even create a character. So it's a little, um, you don't start creating a character until page 87. And <laughs> That's that's a lot of ways into this book before you kind of get to what you as the player are going to be focusing on. I would have liked to have seen the book start with this section and then go into a section on lore. But maybe also the section on lore could have also been moved to the Game Master section. So it's a little weird. Some of the organization is a little weird. But the lore section is really cool because if you are a fan of Talisman, of the board game like so many of us are, then you will recognize all of the spaces on the board are mentioned in this book. You will learn a detailed history of the Sentinel, uh, the guard who is guarding the, uh, the, the, the access across the river into the Middle Realm. I never knew that he had such a detailed lore before, but that's kind of interesting. You get a little bit of section of, of course, of what is role playing because this this could be a pretty good introductory game into tabletop role playing. And you get a turn a glossary of terms here, and then you start getting into the history of the realm. And this is fun. It's a fun read, especially if you are a fan of Talisman. You learn a lot about the background. You learn about the different borders of the realm, the lands, the inner, uh, the outer realm, the inner realm, and the middle realm. You learn about the city and uh, life in the city there, all of the different kinds of shops that take place in the city, uh, the small city of Villadoc, and various settlements that are scattered around the land. Uh, you, get, uh, you get a little history on the tavern, uh, the sepulcher there, uh, the different wilds, the forest, the crags, and the mountains, and then a little section on the middle region and the inner region. I have a feeling they're going to be releasing a uh, expansion a supplement book probably focusing on both of those regions both of those regions because this book is more focused on the outer region on probably kind of like lower level or safer play and then we start getting into the rules now i'm not going to i'm not going to go super deep into the rules but when we start talking about them i'm going to be discussing why i think talisman works so well as a solo game and why it would be easily, easily adapted to solo play. And one of the main reasons why is throughout the book, at least a handful of times, the book mentions that most of the action in this game is driven by the players. As a matter of fact, there is only one time that the GM rolls a die. And that is when they are rolling for uh, damage done from an enemy attack. That's it. Every other die roll is done by the players. This book encourages, actually it demands that the players set the pace for everything. And so in a game like that, where, the, where all of the dice, all of the action is in the, play, uh, the hands of the players, those kinds of games are much easier to adapt to solo because you don't have to simulate any kind of hidden roles or any kind of hidden information on part of the GM. So that's one of the main reasons why I think this game works so well solo. Additionally, because of the fate system and because of the dice system, this game does actually have some kind of Oracle systems built into its core mechanisms, even though it doesn't call them oracles. These two things, when combined with a couple other things, can easily be used as oracles. The, uh, the results of conflict naturally lead to creating story. And in that sense, it is a very easy game to solo 
and to kind of create the thing that you want to create as you are playing the game without needing to bring in any other additional tools. And that is super cool. One of the things that I am doing is when I am playing my game is I am trying to limit how much outside how many outside tools I'm bringing to Talisman. I'm trying to see how much of just this game I can use. And right now what I am focusing on is just using some fate dice in a similar way that uh, Talisman handles its core mechanism of D6. So this is a really, really neat system. And so in this system, whenever you take a test and tests are going to cover everything from combat to doing actions to jumping, uh, crevices to climbing uh, rock faces, you know, tempting, bargaining, uh, using diplomacy, anything is going to be done with 3D6. And you're going to have two dice of one color and one dice of another color. The single color die is called the Kismet die. And this is kind of like a die of chaos. This die will be used to add to your total. So it goes to uh, determining whether or not you do uh, successfully pass the test or you fail the test. And additionally, you want to watch for rolling ones and rolling sixes. When you take a test and your Kismet die comes up as a one, if you pass the test or not, it doesn't matter. But if, you're, if your Kismet die rolls a one, then something bad probably will happen. And usually what that means is that the GM will draw a, um, a token signifying dark fate. And this is a token that the GM can spend on something bad that is going to happen to the players, usually in the form of a powerful attack, a powerful trap, or something like that. If you ever roll a six on your Kismet die, then that means that the player gets to draw a, uh, a token of white fate, of light fate. And this can be spent to, uh, litig to litigate, <laughs> to mitigate luck. Uh, you can spend this on, a, on like a powerful, on a, uh, maybe a more powerful attack. You can spend this on something good that is going to happen to your heroes. So a, a test is uh, set. You have a difficulty chart. You have from easy to nearly impossible easy. The, 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 uh, the, the main target is 8, and then it goes up from 8, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, and nearly impossible is 25 or above. And then it gives you a little spread of each of those, uh, of, of each of those targets. So you could have an easy at 7 or 9. You could have a routine at 10 or 12 or 11, and so on. You can also do a random number generation for a target number. So you could say, okay, so this is going to be an easy test. And you could say uh, it suggests a 2d6. So you could roll 2d6 and 3. That's the target number. This would be something for, you know, if you don't know what the target number should be, you can uh, determine it randomly. But then what you're going to do is the player is going to say, okay, let's say I was going to do something moderate. It was 14. Let's say it was a stealth check and I had a, I had this, the stealth skill. And so I would get to add one of my attributes to that test, which would be agility. Let's say my agility is four. So I would add four to that. I would roll and then I would look eight, nine, adding four is 13. And what did we say? It was 14. I think we said moderate. So I would have failed that test and I would have also rolled a one, which means that I would add a uh, a, a token of dark fate to uh, the GM as a player. And uh, eventually this could be spent for something bad to happen to me. Now, there is also the idea of these doubles and triples. And these kind of dictate the success, the degrees of success. If you succeed and you roll a double in your success, then it is considered a great success. And that means something really good happens. If you uh, succeed and you roll triples, then that is an extraordinary success. And that means something really great happens. You go above and beyond. Not only do you accomplish your goal, but you accomplish your goal and something else really cool happens. Now, what's interesting is that uh, degrees of success from failure to a normal success, which is no doubles or triples, a, a great success and an extraordinary success, those also impact combat because in combat, it's always the players that are rolling dice. So if you are attacking a monster and attacking a monster 
It's just another 3d6 test with a melee skill. So let's say my melee skill, let's say I had a, a plus five and an enemy had a target number of 12. Okay. All right. So there we go. So I got uh, 11 and uh, four is 15 there. And then I hit that target number. And that is a standard success because I didn't have any doubles or triples. So on a, on a standard success, I do damage to the enemy, but they do half of their damage back to me. If I had rolled a double six and also succeeded, that would be a great success. And in combat, a great success means that the enemy does not damage me. Combat is simultaneous in this game. So let's say I rolled uh, three sixes here in combat. So that would be an extraordinary success in combat. And that would mean that I could do more damage. I could knock an enemy prone. Uh, maybe I could spin a point of fate to, do, to trigger some kind of uh, power that I had. So really cool system. The degrees of success lend themselves really well to solo role playing because they help you tell a story depending on what happens, depending on the, the thing that happens depicted by the dice. Now, what I am doing when I'm going to be playing this as a solo game is I'm actually going to be changing up the fate system a little bit. I'm not going to be giving the GM player a dark fate and me a light, uh, a light fate in order to spend. What I am going to be doing is I'm going to be adding those points of fate to a fate pool. And this fate pool is kind of representing the chaos of the universe of of things outside of my power that could benefit me or help me. Maybe some divine power or some evil power. And as the game is progressing, the light side might get more powerful and maybe the dark side might get more powerful. And at certain times in the game, when I need to draw, when I want to spend a fate or when I roll a one and maybe the, um, the GM would want to spend fate in order to trigger some enemy's special ability. Then I draw out of the bag and I see what happens. So there is a little bit of pressure. I'm adding a little bit of a pressure luck element to the game because every time that I want to use fate, there is a chance that I might draw some dark fate and maybe fate is not on my side for that attack. And then I could have to would have to interpret that for something bad that would happen in place of, you know, in addition to maybe a success. So I'm really excited about this fate system. I like pressure luck elements in games, especially solo games, because it gives you, it builds in some tension that is often missing from a solo game. And uh, yeah, this is really cool. So the fate, uh, there's a chart here that of how you can spend uh, your, your points on fate. And then we get into the combat. The combat, like I said, is relatively simple. It's always in the hands of the, the players. The players are always rolling dice. Even when the enemies attack the players, the players are rolling defense dice. So the, the, the GM is never rolling dice. The GM only rolls dice for comp for uh, damage. And it goes into your basic uh, different ways you can attack, you know, melee, you can cast spells and all of that. So you have your core rules basically all up front here. Uh, rules on armor. Armor is a little complicated in that it's actually additional points of um, additional hit points that you get. And then as your armor takes damage, the amount of additional hit points it adds uh, goes down until you repair it. And then we get into our skills and uh, the game is very skill based. You have a whole bunch of skills like animal handling, athletics, empathy, uh, intimidate, missile weapons, persuasion, uh, psychic, ride, sleight of hand, stealth, etc. And each one of those skills will be governed by a certain attribute and uh, that will allow you to add bonuses for when you are doing something pertaining to those skills. And then every skill also has a number of different focuses that you can choose. And so if you are doing a skill test that involves that focus, then you get an additional uh, bonus to those die rolls when you are doing that test. OK, then finally, we kind of move into our section on character creation. And we start with our ancestries. We have our typical ancestries like dwarves and elves and ghouls. Yes, remember in um, in Talisman, you could play as a ghoul. A ghoul was a character you could play. And they have included ancestries like that. You can play as in the, uh, the, the dungeon book as a minotaur character ancestry. 
or perhaps you could play as a troll. So you can play as as ancestries that are, that often are not included as races in other RPGs, and that is super cool. Ghouls are really interesting. They kind of take care of of cemeteries, so you could play a ghoul undertaker or a grave digger or something like that. That is really really cool. Then you also have humans. You have lay walkers, which are kind of like these fey creatures. Uh, of course, sprites you can play as. Uh, there's your sprite standee there, and then trolls, and then you have your classes, and you have all kinds of different classes, just like you would in the uh, board game. You have your assassin here, and the assassin is pretty cool. They have all kinds of different powers, and your your class, when you pick a class, so when you create a character, uh, there is no, uh, there, there's no dice rolling in creating a character. Your, your uh, ancestry and your class will give you your stats and will allow you to choose from a certain number of starting abilities. And then they will also allow you to choose from a bigger pool of skills and other abilities to, uh, to help modify your class and make them unique. So you have assassin, druids, of course. The, uh, the druid, where's my druid standee? Did I not take out the druid? I guess I didn't take out the druid. There is the cool looking elf standee though and your priest, and of course your prophet or your prophetess, the prophetess in uh, Talisman there. You have your scout. Uh, there's our scout standee. I love having this stuff from Old Talisman. Uh, your sorcerer. Oh, there's the druid. Yeah, your druid standee there. Really cool. I like character creation. It's very, it's pretty quick. There's no dice rolling, so there's nothing up to chance. You get to craft the exact kind of character you want. And the stats it does use, so just like Talisman, it does have two core stats, and those are called your attributes of strength and craft. And those pretty much dictate how much damage you do in physical combat and how much damage you do in, uh, in psychic combat. And then underneath your, uh, your two attributes, you have corresponding aspects. They're called aspects. So we have brawn, agility, and metal. Those are physical aspects. And then you have insight, wits, and resolve. And those are uh, your craft aspects. What's interesting is when you're creating your character, you will take your strength that you are given from your class or from your ancestry. You will multiply that by two, and then you can distribute that many points to your aspects. And same with craft. However, after you have created your character, then your strength and your craft, those become dependent upon your aspects because as you raise your aspects, you will get to add to your strength or your craft. So it's a really interesting uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship between your attributes and your aspects. You have your ancestry, you have your background, your class, your level, experience points, and then your alignment. And uh, I am playing as an evil character and evil characters aren't necessarily evil in this game. They're just kind of selfish or uh, self-serving. So then we finally get to the chapter on character creation and advancement and it goes through a lot of the things that I said there. And then it's kind of constantly reminding you while you are playing that you as the player are in control of the game. And again, that is one of the reasons why I think this is such an easy game for uh, solo play. Now, there are some issues and let's talk about one of the issues here with um, with gear. And this is one of the things about what I was talking about, about editing. This game really needs a better editor. These are all kinds of different advanced special abilities and skills that your different uh, classes can learn as you level up. There are a lot of them and they are really cool. But in the, in the equipment section, it has this whole rule created for gold. And gold in this game is supposed to be really simplified where if anything costs less than one gold, when you want to buy it, you roll a d6. If you roll a one, you pay one gold. If you roll anything else, you don't pay anything. And I thought that is super cool. I love that because there are things that a hero just, you know, a hero should be able to just walk in and buy some rope. You know, heroes shouldn't need to worry about buying rope, but sometimes they might. And I think it kind of like balances out. However, when you look at the price of everything, there is only one item that costs less than one gold, and that is a staff. I am completely baffled by that. 
they created this whole rule for somebody buying a staff. <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't get it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's really weird. And there's quite a few little things like that. The game will often confuse attributes and um, aspects. Sometimes it, they, they, they get they get their own terms confused sometimes. Sometimes the rules for the armor are a little um, iffy. I'm not quite sure. They might mention here, they mentioned that armor has armor points. But then on the chart of armor, they call it protection. And I'm not sure if those two things are the same. So there's just some weird inconsistencies like that. It, it this, this game needs, maybe it needs a second edition in order to kind of... Uh, sand over some of the rough edges perhaps but the core mechanisms i think are really really solid so in addition to the players being in control of the dice in addition to the players being uh driving the action another thing that i think this game does really well you have a whole bunch of spells here so we're just going to flip through all the spells and like a few different uh, schools of magic but i think the next thing that this game does that is incredible is the strangers and allies and followers. So a huge, huge thing of Talisman was the use of followers and strangers. So followers, when you found a follower in the board game of Talisman, they would join your party, they would join you as an entourage, and they would follow you around, and they would help you uh, get past challenges. And it was nearly impossible to do well in the game without having a bunch of followers. You could use them as meat shields. You could use their special powers to help you. And then there was also strangers and strangers were super cool because they would come out on the land and you could meet them and they would you would be able to interact with them in some simple way to maybe gain a boon or press your luck a little bit to get something good with the chance of something bad happening to you. But the RPG has taken that idea of has taken the RPG idea of NPCs as non-player characters and adapted that to strangers and followers from the board game. And it is awesome. I love this system so much because it adds a mechanical, a, a gameplay reason for players to interact with NPCs. In solo role-playing, sometimes it's a little difficult to have those interactions with NPCs because what are you really doing? Are you having a conversation with yourself in your head? You know, what is the NPC going to do for you? Uh, de determining those, those mechanical reasons for an NPC to exist can be hard in solo role-playing, but Talisman does away with all of that by introducing concrete mechanical elements that the NPCs add to the game. So you have a whole bunch of different strangers as NPCs and you have a chart that tells you if you are hated or devote, if you are hated by the NPC or if this NPC slash stranger is devoted to you. And depending on how you interact with them, you can give them gifts. You can, you know, you can improve the way that the NPC reacts to you, or maybe you can damage it and they can turn, they can turn their backs on you. They can turn their back on you. But as you look through the list of strangers, of NPCs, you they have a benefit. So an armorsmith is an NPC. Okay, what's his benefit? He can fix that. So um, an, an armorsmith with a neutral or better attitude will gladly repair a suit of armor for free or uh, for a fee of one gold. Only the best steel. Armorsmiths have suits of armor, helmets, and shields available for purchase at standard cost. These are usually available in multiple sizes or in sizes that they can quickly alter. If a PC is looking to buy a particular item, ask the player to roll 2d6. On a 6 plus, the armorsmith has that item in their size or close enough. So really cool. And then also, each of these NPCs will also have their base stat or their attribute of a strength and craft and a life. So if they end up joining you as a follower, then you can take them and you might be able to use their strength and craft or their life to help you while you are playing the game. So we have all kinds of different NPCs to interact with and each one has a benefit. Each one has a gameplay reason for interacting with. We have astrologers, we you know, cut purses, dung sweepers, healers, and some of these also have little charts that you can roll on. So very, very handy 
for solo role playing. Maybe you meet a fairy and maybe the fairy is going to give you a random benefit. You know, you can have a whole quest where you're trying to rescue a fairy and then the fairy has a chart of benefits or maybe you you are you come across an evil fairy and they might curse you. Uh, you can utilize the uh, the expertise of a healer. Maybe you come across a leper and there's a whole chart on what the leper might do. Or a leprechaun, a peddler, a shrine priest, a street sage, a talismonger, and then how to gain those as allies, and then how to gain followers. And followers, this is besides the 3d6 system with the Kismet die with that one and six, and the fate system using the fate as kind of an oracle or as a way to, to simulate randomness and using the dice and that the degrees of success to tell stories with dice rolls the followers oh man this section is awesome so just like the followers in the game in the board game and the rpg you can gain followers and they will help you with all kinds of different things they have all of these different abilities that you can spend a currency on called loyalty and as you spend loyalty you can utilize your followers benefits and then each follower has a way that you can um, improve their loyalty. So you can spend their loyalty as a currency, and then you might have to do something to gain it back. And if their loyalty ever drops to zero, then they leave your party. Uh, another thing that you can do is if you have followers and they have life points, they have health points, then when you take damage, you can actually uh, push off that damage to your follower. So that is also another way that you could kind of balance the game around only having one hero. You could take one hero in a solo uh, play session and just give them a handful of followers to help them, to help augment their only being one hero. So we have all kinds of different followers. We have animals, we have apprentice, a minstrel, apprentice, wizard, a bear. And each one of these will have a, a, a couple of different abilities, so benefits. So the apprentice minstrel, uh, the apprentice, the apprentice can carry a tune, but sometimes your performance carries them. Prefers to follow minstrels. So if you are playing as a minstrel, you could have an apprentice. Uh, benefits: they can cast a kind of a spell of calming music. You can spend one loyalty, and the apprentice minstrel plays a calming tune, preventing a targeted wild animal from protect from attacking. If the animal is attacked, the calming tune is broken. So backup band, uh, this is a, if you are a minstrel and you can spend one loyalty, the apprentice minstrel speaks inspiring words. One ca character who can hear the words chosen by the apprentice's leader is granted a bonus equal to the follower's craft on their next attack. And so then that minstrel will have strength, it'll have craft, it'll have a number of life points, it'll have its max loyalty, and a, uh, a thing on restoring loyalty. So to restore the loyalty for an apprentice minstrel, you, uh, when you pay the follower one gold or give them an item worth at least one gold, they will gain. Uh, they want a coin. Toss a coin to your witcher, right? <laughs> but uh, or toss a coin to your minstrel. But you can have camels, cats, um, a good alkalite, a dog, a falcon or a hawk, a gnome, an earth elemental, um, a mercenary, a messenger pigeon, a mule can help you carry stuff, a scout. You have a servant, a temple alkalite, a wolf, and all kinds of things. And then we get into the, the bestiary here. Another thing that I think benefits this game in solo play is it's, it's pretty structured. Okay, yeah. So in the Game Master section, Chapter 5 in Adventuring, it goes over the rules for exploration and the exploration roles. So if you are off, you know, uncharted paths and exploring, you might need a guide and the guide is going to have to take certain tests. Again, 3D6, adding a, an attribute or a skill. And uh, you consult the, uh, the, the, the difficulty is usually a 14. And then depending on the degree of success or failure, good or bad things will happen on that journey. And also on the Kismet die, on a roll of a one or a six, then, the G, then something really good or something really bad will happen. You will often have to as bad things happen on journeys, it'll tell you to introduce a hazard. And hazards could be things like it, it recommends, you know, a swollen stream, an insect swarm, or an avalanche. I wish there were more hazard examples. But what I'm thinking of doing is using the um, charts in Table Fables 2, the road events and encounters and landmarks and foraging 
I will use those tables for a hazards. And then you have a, a role of, of a watcher, of a hunter, and camping. And so those are all roles that you need to assign to players. And they can do multiple things. Uh, sometimes you might only want one person on watch. And then again, you roll your, your oh, that was a really good roll. So a, a, you have a 15 there with a double. So that is a great success. So if I was on watch and I rolled a great success and the watcher discovers the presence of a nearby enemy. After the GM determines this type of enemy, the watcher makes a survival uh, test to identify it on a successful roll. If they choose to encounter the enemy, they get a plus three bonus to the resulting stealth test on the on an ambush enemy chart. So again, you might discover an enemy, but it's up to the players to decide if they want to encounter that enemy or not. And the reason why that's important is because remember, enemies don't roll to attack. Players roll to attack, and depending on how they do, they will take damage from the enemy. So combat is simultaneous and it's very deadly. You have a really good chance of taking damage. So in this game, you kind of want to avoid combat a lot of times. You have a whole section on traps. And again, traps are very mechanical. It tells you what you need to find the trap, what you need to disarm the trap, what skills are needed. And then it gives you some example traps. There are a lot more example traps in the, uh, in the dungeon. Let's go back to our other strangers. We have uh, different kinds of NPCs. We have strangers, allies, followers, and then we also have enemies. And enemies, this game has a huge bestiary and it's really cool. I love it. It has, it's uh, organized into animals, undead, spirits, all that kind of stuff. Your enemies will have, uh, the threat is like, so uh, an ape has a threat of 13. That's the target number I would need uh, to, to to attack the ape successfully. Okay, so let's say I was attacking the ape and I could roll on uh, my 13 is the threat there and I needed to roll 13. I would add my brawn. Oh, that's a bad roll. Five, six, seven, eight. And I my brawn was four. Let's say that was a 12. So that is a fail. So now uh, I, because I failed, then the ape would do its damage to me and its damage to me would be uh, 1d3 plus 4. And so I would roll 1d3 plus 4, and then that would be the damage that I would take. And then here, you have a chance to spend a point of negative fate to uh, of dark fate in order to trigger this fearsome roar. So at that point, since I failed, I would probably reach into my, my uh, bag of fate here to see if the ape does his fearsome roar. And... No, he does not do his fearsome roar, but we are removing a point of light fate from the pool of fate, meaning that if there was a uh, dark in there, then uh, my next time I draw from the bag, I have a better chance of drawing dark fate. So that's how I would use fate in combat to play solo. We have all kinds of cool enemies, carrying crows, giant beetles, giant worms, serpents. So lots of cool big animals to fight in case you wanted to do a real kind of like sword and sorcery style adventure. But then we go into our typical, we have bandits and cave trolls, uh, different kinds of kobolds, goblins, doppelgangers, basilisks, manticores, harpies, barrow whites, ghosts, uh, will-o'-wisps, specters. Uh, death knights and liches and wraiths and skeletons and zombies, all kinds of really, really cool enemies. And you also get in the back of the book here, you get a really good chart of random encounters in woods, in dungeons or in planes, that kind of in different environments based on character level. So very, very handy. And that kind of leads me to the last section here where you get a section of a uh, of cool magic items and you do have to identify magic items and a lot of the magic items do have powers based on the roll of that kismet die or based on a draw of a light fate. So again, there are just a lot of really good mechanisms in this game and I think that's why it is so, uh, it lends itself so well to solo play. And then you get a little um, adventure here in the back. But the appendices, have one other or two more reasons why I think this is good for solo play. And that is one has a list of critical failures, actually three reasons. This critical failure uh, chart is always cool because uh, it can introduce story elements. And then we have this idea of aspirations. 
Aspirations are 1d6 charts and each alignment, ancestry, and class has an aspiration chart. And at the beginning of each game or a session or maybe a quest, you can roll on each of those charts for your character to find out something that they want to do on that adventure. And as they accomplish each of those different aspirations from each chart, they get a point of light fate. So that is another way to add some good luck into your pool of fate. I love this. It gives you some direction as a player on where to take your, your session, your solo session. Very, very cool. And then of course we have, I already went over this here. You have all of your encounters. And then this appendix here, appendix three, is a D66 chart of interesting locations. I love this. This is so cool. You have all kinds of different things, like different kinds of altars, of fountains, idols, fairy glades, a blighted shrine, a cave. Now, some of these charts, some of these tables have tables within tables, such as like the mystical portal or the pool of fortitude, pool of fortune, a tomb, a tranquil glade, a sh another shrine, a sacrificial altar, all kinds of really interesting things to find on this D66 chart. I love this. I wish there was a whole book of interesting talisman locations. So yeah, let's uh, review real quick the reasons why I think Talisman Adventures does lend itself to solo play. And that is the player is in charge of all of the action. The players in Talisman Adventures drive 99% of the game. It is in the player's hands. All dice rolls are done by the player. The way that the degrees of success and the kismet die kind of lend themselves to becoming kind of like an oracle to help you tell your stories. That is another reason why. The fate system, using the fate system as kind of like this pool of random elements that might be out of your control, some kind of like divine presence. I think that is a really cool thing. The followers and the strangers and the mechanical reasons to interact with NPCs in this game is another reason. And then we get that those aspirations to help you drive your personal story and that list of interesting locations, which can help you uh, create a quest. So yeah, there are a lot of really great things about Talisman Adventures. Unfortunately, there are those kind of uh, weird formatting issues or organizational issues, I should say. There are a lot of charts scattered throughout the book, and those charts are not collected in an appendix at the end, which I think they should be. Any RPG that has a lot of charts, all of those charts should be collected at the end of the book for easy access. I need to look into the Game Master's screen. I would hope that it would have all of those charts because there are a lot of little charts that you want to look at. But yeah, this is a really cool game and I'm really excited to play it. And I want to talk, I know this video is going to be long. This is kind of like an epic Tales of the Dungeon. This book I was looking forward to. I was hoping it would have a whole nother chart of interesting locations to discover in a dungeon, but it does not. It hardly has anything to help with creating dungeons. And that is something that I was really hoping it would have. It is a pretty basic book. It has some cool information on different dungeons, especially it has some cool lore where it goes into the history of dungeons and the land of Talisman. And you get kind of like a travel log of famous dungeons of the realm. So this is kind of cool. You can learn about the sewers or the rat's nest or the catacombs, uh, the deep root and forest hold, alabaster halls under the white horse hills. So it has some cool lore and stuff. It doesn't have a lot of mechanisms. And the main book of Talisman has so many mechanisms to help facilitate gameplay. And the Talisman dungeon book just seems to have a lot of ideas. And ideas are a dime a dozen. And I was hoping for more reasons, for more things that would help me create dungeons and run dungeons in a game. What it does have, though, is a couple new ancestries and classes. And this is pretty cool because now you can play as a minotaur and a vampire as uh, ancestries. And then you have two classes. You have a necromancer and a tomb robber. And this is where this book really inspired me. So I saw this tomb robber class. And I thought, okay, that sounds cool. I want to play as a tomb robber who's maybe being hired to go 
and uh, loot different tombs. Maybe some people who are into antiquities want me to go and gain and gain treasures for their museum or something like Indiana Jones. Or maybe there's a maybe there's a, a, a dungeon that was discovered with a bunch of booby traps, and the city is the city guard has hired me to go in and clear out the traps, kind of like you know uh, people will go and clear out minefields for safety, that kind of thing. Kind of a blue collar character. I like the idea of blue collar characters of them not being adventurers for the heroic sense, but them adventuring because that's part of their job. And so that was really cool. I thought, okay, so this is really enticing to me, this tomb robber class. And then I started looking into strangers and followers. And I noticed some really interesting followers here, such as a miner, or maybe a torch bearer, a trap smith, a treasure hunter, or a tunnel fighter. And all of these... Um, all of these different followers that I was reading about, they made me think of my tomb robber as having a business, of having a business like Divers Incorporated. And I would be stationed in the city and I would have employees. And so I made my, uh, my tomb robber here, Rodney Barrowsmith. And his uh, skills, he has athletics with a focus in climbing, evaluate with a focus in antiquities, notice with a focus in searching, sleight of hand, uh, stealth with a focus in ruins, tinker with a focus in pick locks, melee with a focus in small blades and bargain. I have some special abilities where I have spare parts where I can take parts from traps and make my own traps. I'm a good trap springer, so I'm good at dissembling uh, traps. And I have boast and swagger. I like to uh, talk big about my exploits. But then I put together a list of my followers. And these are my employees uh, employed under Divers Incorporated. So I have a miner, a torch bearer, a treasure hunter, and a tunnel fighter. And these are the, the people that I'm going to take in with me as I adventure, as I am hired by people in Talisman City to go down into the depths to find discoveries, to find treasure, to find antiquities, to disarm traps, to clear out sewers of rats and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to have to kind of manage this business. And all of these followers, they regain loyalty when they are paid one gold. So I have to pay them a salary. And if they die, then I have to hire new ones and <laughs> put job postings up. And that could be a, a whole adventure as uh, on, on its own. And what I'm thinking about using as some of my main uh, gameplay as far as the dungeons and the underground environments that I'm going to be exploring is uh, using Downcrawl. And Downcrawl is a supplement created by Aaron A. Reed. And it is all about exploring these vast underground environments called volumes. And these are huge chambers that could have their own, their whole, their whole ecosystems and, and weather and, and uh, different kinds of people living down here. And this is a whole book on generating these vast underground tunnels and chambers and volumes and cities and uh, different kinds of people and different things to explore, different challenges to have. And so one of my main goals as Rodney Barrowsmith, as the sole proprietor, the manager, the CEO of Divers Incorporated is mapping the down, the down under or the under down. So really looking forward to that. So even though I was pretty disappointed with this book, with the dungeon book on a whole, it inspired my sessions that I want to play with Talisman as a solo RPG. So I'm really thankful for it for that. However, this book has some major, major issues. These new classes and ancestries, they feel incomplete because uh, the aspirations. So the aspirations section at the end of the talisman book that I liked so much that gave you a purpose. You could roll on random charts for your purpose. The new classes and the new ancestries in this do not have any of those charts. That is one way that they are incomplete. Another way that they are incomplete, and which even which is kind of even a more broken way, is in the main book. 
each class has a starting pack, starting kits. And this tells you what those classes start with, what items they start with, and how much gold they start with. Well, the classes in this book don't have starting kits either. It's really, really odd how poorly made this book is compared to the original book. There's a lot of things in this book feel completely unfinished. Even in the way that they organize the abilities and skills in this book with each of the um, classes is a little more confusing than it is in the book. I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure how they dropped the ball so much on this book. I have an email out to Pegasus Spiel to say, hey, where are the aspirations for these new classes and these new um, ancestries? And where are the starting kits? How how do I know what my tomb robber starts with? Um, how do I know how much gold they start with? So just really, really odd. I think the only really cool thing about the dungeon book is that <laughs> this one class, the Tomb Raider, and the followers. The followers are really cool, but it's only really kind of helping me because it's helping me tell the story that I want to tell. But most of this book, I uh, actually the trap section. The trap section is also cool. You have a whole section on traps and underground uh, hazards, and then you get a whole bunch of example traps. So these sample traps here, we have or simple traps, exploding chest, uh, falling block trap, flaming vent trap, all of these different traps. And it gives you uh, ways to use dark fate and ways to use the kismet die. So mechanical reasons, mechanical things about these traps, which will make them easy to employ in, in a solo game talk a little bit about how I am using also these uh, fate dice here in conjunction with the, um, the mechanism. So um, I'm kind of using these as an oracle as a way to interpret uh, questions that I'm going to be using in this game. And I am incorporating kind of a kismet die system to my fate uh, die rolls. So just like how this would roll a one or a six, and that could be used as an oracle to interpret further good or bad things that happen when I'm taking tests, I'm using uh, the plus, the good, the, uh, and the bad on the fate die to represent more beneficial or detrimental things that might happen when I am consulting this oracle. Uh, for instance, let's say I am sneaking in a dungeon and there are some guards. This isn't like a natural dungeon. This was an underground fortress. And I'm down the hallway, there is a door. And I need to sneak up to the door, but I'm not sure if the guards are, are taking their duties seriously. You know, are the guards uh, carefully watching this tunnel? Okay, so... The normal dice give me a plus and minus and nothing good or bad. So just kind of a typical, I would interpret this as being typical to the situation. So these guards are in their natural habitat of their underground fortress. So they are probably paying attention. And so that would mean that, okay, uh, the, the difficulty check to get past the guards would probably not be easy or moderate. It might be moderate or hard moderate. So then I could take my test. I could look at that. So I would say that would be like a high moderate. So that would be about a 15. So I would need to do a stealth check of 15 in order to sneak past these guards to get to the end of the hallway to open up that door. So I have a stealth and I have a focus on ruins. Uh, these could be considered ruins. They could be uh, uh, old ruins that have been taken over by these uh, by these uh, bandits and, and turned into an underground fortress. So I'll give myself a bonus there. So for my stealth is agility, so I get to add a four. And because I have the focus of ruins, I get to add a two. So I get to add a six to this roll. And I'm looking for, let's say a 15. I think that's what we said, 15 moderate challenge. Okay, so I got a nine, 10, 11, 12, plus six. Yes, so I 18. So I successfully uh, bypass the guards. I get to the end of the uh, hallway, but I have no idea if this door is locked. So is, is the door locked? Okay, so uh, that's another kind of uh, 
the positive and the negative kind of cancel each other out. So is this door locked? I would say that this is kind of a neutral interpretation. Um, if there was something I was looking for through this door and it is in a natural habitat where a door would be locked, a fortress, then yes, the door is locked. However, because my fake kismet die gave me a plus, gave me a, a, a bonus, I would say yes, it's locked, but it's an easy lock to get by. So I would say that that is for a tinker um, with uh, skill and pick locks. This would be a routine challenge, a low routine challenge, so a 10. So again, let's say I need to get a 10. So my tinker, I have an agility of four and I pick lock. So again, I'm going to add six to this. And oh, look at that. OK, so this is interesting. This is really cool. So we have a six and a seven plus a six is 12 or 13. And I needed a 10, so I passed the check. And I roll doubles, which means that it is a great success. So I easily open up the lock, but I also rolled a one on the Kismet die. So that would mean that I would add a point of dark fate to my pool of, of fate. I could also push my luck and say, okay, um, let's draw fate out. And if I draw a dark fate, then maybe a guard does end up noticing me. If I draw a light fate, then I slip into the room completely unnoticed and I have free reign of that room. Oh, dark fate. OK, so I tempted fate. Something bad happened. I got the door um, unlocked. And then all of a sudden a guard's like, hey, what are you doing? And so I have to make a split second decision. I'm going to. Uh, throw one of my daggers at him. I don't have uh, the throw skill. Let's say, I don't know how much the threat is for a bandit. Let's say it's 12. So I get to make an unskilled test. So I don't get to add anything here. Uh, 12, eight, nine, 10. No, I do not. So I missed the dagger. I missed the throw. And then now I'm in combat. So yeah, so that's how I would kind of, I'm, I'm using the fate dice along with the degrees of success and the kismet dice and the fate pool as a way to to play talisman as a solo rpg and i think it's working out pretty well i'm not needing to bring anything else in i do have my encounter building cards just in case i need a little something else to help but yeah, I'm going to be really enjoying this game. I'm really thankful for that Dungeon Dive viewer, for Liam, for sending me this game, for introducing me to something that I thought I had no interest in. I'm very appreciative of that because I am really loving Talisman Adventures as a solo role-playing game. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this long video. Uh, thanks for watching. Those of you who stuck to the end, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.